Yeah. And my question is, uh, how did this affect the political psyche of the Sinhala bourgeoisie politicians? And, and how did it in particular differ from the manner in which the Indian bourgeoisie... Yeah, uh, yeah it was always a contrast between what was happening in India and what was happening in Sri Lanka. And it was only radicals like the labor leader A. Gunasinghe who, who spoke of the Sri Lanka leaders as a bunch of uh, people running behind the governor to get rewards and titles and uh, so forth. He denounced them every time. And he said, unlike the Indians, who, when the Prince of Wales visited in 1922, black flags were put up all over India. But when he came to, the prince came to Colombo, he was greeted, um, as Gunasinghe said, like cringing beggars. They went and knelt before him and made a, made a mockery of uh, Sri Lanka by behaving like that. So there was always some small voices who were neither based on uh, uh, class or caste, but who were leading another group of working class who would point out these things. Uh, but the number of radicals was small, and that movement only came up later in the 30s. And Dr. Kumar, why was it different in India? In, well, in India, they, their bourgeoisie was um, based on industrial production and uh, much more industrial activity, which leads to a certain type of thinking. Whereas our bourgeoisie was starting with selling firewood, had m moved or up or down, I don't know, to liquor. And, and then you find them uh, needing the British because the British controlled uh, the whole monopoly of the liquor trade. They farmed out and auctioned the right to sell liquor. It was a government monopoly, the right to sell liquor. They auctioned it to the bidders. And um, so those people were very much in the um, uh, indebted to British colonial rulers. In India, they were much more um, uh, militant. And you get leaders like Gandhi and Nehru, who I can't think of anyone at that time who would be comparable uh, in Sri Lanka. And Gunasinghe also kept on saying, why don't these bunch of lackeys go to India and learn something there uh, instead of coming and betraying us here? Uh, so, you know, it was a, it was a bit tense. Uh, I want to touch also on the liquor industry that you referred to uh, very briefly. Uh, the liquor industry was, I mean, one of the most prominent uh, sources of income for the Sinhalese bourgeoisie. Um, but it's interesting also to note that the dominant Sinhala Buddhist nationalist uh, revival critique raised by people like Anagarika Dharmapala, uh, their critique was largely uh, directed at the colonial powers coming into Sri Lanka, corrupting the innocent Sinhalese who were not who did not know much about uh, liquor or were not consuming liquor. But they've kept out uh, this aspect of the Sinhalese bourgeoisie who were prominent members of the industry. What was the relationship between this particular Sinhala bourgeoisie, which was part of, very much part of the liquor industry, and the temperance movement and the Sinhala Buddhist nationalist movement at that time? Yeah. As I said, uh, the, the new class that emerged through liquor uh, profits, uh, has, many of them had been Buddhist earlier, but they thought it was uh, uh, opportune to convert. And there was a clergyman in Kandy who was busy converting all these Jeronis, Soizas, and all these people who were Buddhist. Jeronis was after all known as Vedamatya, and he was a famous uh, famous of being a Buddhist. So I was then thinking, what is the advantage of conversion? Mm. But the advantage was that you get access to 
high levels of society, maybe even the governor, maybe people regard you good Christian gentleman, uh, you see the bishop, you can do so many things. Then you give a lot of money to churches and they were happy doing that round. And um, uh, when um, the liquor renters who were Buddhist, uh, they always had a uh, kind of, uh, always were hurt by the Obesekara saying, you have ill-gotten gains. I don't know, Obesekara's ill-gotten gains are from land grabbing and doing various other things. So was everybody land grabbing, um, including these liquor merchants. Um, so the, the main point here is that uh, when, when the Buddhist of Panadura and Moratua, uh, or perhaps I'll give you one case. When the leading arachnator of Panadura, I think, Jeremy Dias died, his wife, uh, Celestina Rodrigo, uh, inherited the whole bags of gold. Now, she started now giving, distributing it. She was a good Buddhist devout lady. She gave a science lab to Ananda College and she used a lot of that money to uh, start Visaka Vidyale because she was concerned with Buddhist women's education. And now, the, the girls of Visaka who go to the Jeremias Dias Hall every morning, there's a picture of Celestina who's Mrs. Dias, and she is called Mrs. Jeremias Dias. So they think, they think their founder was the man. He had died long ago, Jeremias Dias. There's no acknowledgement of Celestine, and I pointed this out to them many times, but they, they're not interested. So that's up to them. Uh, the other important thing that took place is that Many of the next generation of the sons of liquor renters, no doubt the daughters too, were a bit worried because you see the state was opening taverns everywhere and Anagarika Dharmapala was denouncing the government for opening so many thousands of taverns in every corner. Uh, many of them joined the temperance movement and uh, the most famous was uh, this Jeremias Dias is uh, Celestina's son, Arthur Dias, who was known as Kosmama because he advocated the planting of kos trees in every garden in Sri Lanka. People still remember him. Um, he joined the temperance movement, though he had benefited enormously from the liquor industry. So things like that were happening. Uh Coming to the Tamil ethnic community, uh, your book contains again an interesting discussion about a number of uh, Tamil families, uh, the Pondambalam Kumaraswamy family being uh, a prominent one, and people like uh, Muthu Kumaraswamy, uh, Ramanathan, Arunachalam, and so on. Uh, and their rise uh, is attributed to this fact of. Uh, them coming to Colombo. Uh, how did they become the Tamil bourgeoisie in Ceylon and, and mm. what was specific about their politics? Was it the same kind of politics that the singular bourgeoisie practiced or were they of a different kind? Well, uh, their money was not in liquor because uh, the liquor industry in Jaffna uh, never flourished. Uh, they say because of the availability of Palmyra, Tony, anyone could, could do it themselves and they didn't need the uh, nicotine industry so much. So the people who were going in through the Jaffna rents were small timers. Uh, by small time, I mean like in Colombo, there was a small timer called Vallavattage Baba Appu. People of that, uh, that kind of person were the people who in Jaffna too, some guys were just doing liquor rent. 
uh, it was not big business. Uh, the big business was in the traders. There were some very important uh, Jaffna Tamil traders who had ships and were doing a lot of trade here and there, who made judicious marriages into other uh, wealthy families of Jaffna. And their wealth too was consolidated by their links to the trading classes. And they, they all had to come to Colombo to flourish. And then uh, next generation sent to Royal College and Arunachalam, all those Ramanathan, all had the Western education. And they were, they were very much ahead of the Bandarnaikas, certainly, in the sense of uh, knowing about reforms. Ramanathan, who in his early years were very radical, was in the Legislative Council. He protested against the um, coffee laws, which penalized uh, peasants who sold coffee. Coffee beans, saying it's all uh, stolen. So he made a big speech saying this is very uh, callous and uh, uh, objectionable laws. That was quite early on. Later he became reactionary and that's another story. Uh, by 1930 he was against universal suffrage. His younger brother Arunachalam was the real radical. He supported working class rights. He had his own uh, trade union which he was supporting. Uh, and Gunasinghe and others uh, thought of very highly of him. And he became the president of the Ceylon National Congress. I mean the Sinhalese and Tamil both um, thought of him as a, one of the great leaders of Sri Lanka. Unfortunately, he died young in 1924. But his contribution uh, I have often mentioned as being something we, we should not uh, forget. Uh, Dr. Kumar, would you also say that, uh, or would you say that the colonial powers were, in a sense, privileging the uh, Tamil people or the Tamil bourgeoisie, which is a popular claim made yeah, by Yeah, there's a bit election. of mythology about claims like that. Uh, the advantages uh, uh, Jaffna Tamils had was they had a very good system of education through American missionaries and others. And they benefited and entered many of the professions and became not just clerks and lawyers and doctors, but you know, politicians and they were highly educated people. Uh, the idea that um, there was some, some uh, favoritism towards Tamils, I mean, without proof, I think it remains at the level of current uh, mythology. I, I haven't uh, come across any, this idea that, you know, if there were half the medical students are not Sinhalese, then the Sinhalese get excited. Or if so many doctors are produced and there are several eminent Tamils, there is that kind of thing has been happening for a long time. And I used to tackle our university students, put these questions to them. What does it matter if the, how many single is a Tamil doctors? What does it matter? The doctors are the uh, good doctor. Oh, it matters. We also want to be doctors. And they were arguing back at me. So I said, you know, I'll tell you a fact. 100% of snake charmers are Tamil. You guys want to do that one also? Then the shara. So, you know, there's a way of uh, 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 sort of dealing with this kind of very serious problem in a bit of a flippant way to make them show that really a lot of this is uh, unnecessary to start thinking in, ter in those terms. But I'd like to come back to a point which we have left out, is the women of the bourgeoisie. Because with this whole liquor renting and large sums of money, the first task of the ladies at home was to count the money. And several people have told me how the soizas and all used to count the money, put it in bags and put it in a dungeon downstairs or something. Uh, and in their wills, they mention um, uh, bottles of liquor in the basement and 